and this is a monthly series on how good practice, policy, and research can improve health care for culturally diverse populations. And we're very thankful for sponsorship from the California Endowment. Since 1997, DiversityRx has been involved with policy development, research, education, and support for health care providers, policymakers, researchers, and advocates working to improve health care for minority, immigrant, and indigenous communities. You can find out more about our work at diversityrx.org, on the Class Talk listserv, or at diversityrxconference.org. We also run a national conference on quality health care for culturally diverse populations, as well as these webinars, communities of practice, and peer learning networks. For this webinar, we just want to run through a few little technical things. The audience will be muted throughout the webinar. You can submit questions at any time using the questions window at the bottom of your control panel. And if you would like your question to go to a particular speaker, please note that in the question. And if you notice at the bottom of these slides, it tells you how you can switch from voice over IP to a telephone connection, which might provide for better audio quality. When you ask questions, you use the questions pane. And we will be forwarding those questions to the presenters, and we will try to get to as many as possible. The GoToWebinar control panel will sometimes auto-hide on you. And if you'd like to make sure that that stays visible so that you can find your question, page, question pane easily, you can go to View, then make sure that auto-hide the control panel is not checked. And now for our webinar. The webinar is titled NCQA Multicultural Healthcare Standards and Distinction Program. And we are very fortunate to have three speakers who will be sharing with us the new standards. And we have Jessica Briefer French, who's a senior consultant for research at the National Committee for Quality Assurance. And she's responsible for the development and oversight of research projects that support measurement and evaluation of new areas of healthcare quality. Currently, she's directing multiple projects on measuring, evaluating, improving care for vulnerable po populations, including multicultural populations, children, and children with special health care needs. She directs projects to develop standards for multicultural health care distinction, issue awards to health plans for innovations in multi multicultural health care, and provide demonstration grants for small physician practices to improve care for the minority patients. We also are very fortunate to have Ellen Wu, who's the Executive Director of the California Pan-Ethnic Health Network. She's been the Executive Director for CPEN since 2001. It's a statewide health policy organization whose mission is to eliminate health disparities by advocating for public policies to improve the health of communities of color. Catherine Colton is the Director for External Quality Data Initiatives at Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. She served on several national advisory committees in the area of healthcare, performance, measuring, and reporting. She serves as a member of the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics for eight years, chairing its Quality of Healthcare Work Group. She's led Harvard Pilgrim's initiatives to identify and reduce racial ethnic disparities in healthcare since 1998. And we welcome you all to this webinar, and we look forward to a very substantive um, presentation now. And also, for all of you attendees, we hope that you've had a chance to look at the our website, DiversityRx Conference slash Webinar 6, where NCQA and our presenters have been very um, generous in sharing resources. And there's several resources already available on the website for you. Thank you. Well, thank you. This is Jessica, and I am uh, delighted to talk with you today about NCQA's Multicultural Healthcare Standards. Um, the uh, session agenda uh, should be showing on your screen, um, and um, I hope this webinar will be useful and informative to you. We plan to provide a brief overview of the standards and share the process we went through to develop them, giving a couple of concrete examples to illustrate how different stakeholder perspectives are integrated and reconciled to form a set of standards. Um, if you could advance to slide three, please. Um, there will be plenty of time for questions and answers at the end, although, um, as said earlier, we may not be able to get to all the questions live, but we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, just a brief introduction of NCQA. For those who are not familiar with NCQA, the National Committee for Quality Assurance 
is a private not-for-profit organization that measures and evaluates the quality of health care. We're best known for our health plan accreditation and HEDIS measures, although we have a wide variety of measurement and evaluation programs that focus on different kinds of health care entities. Uh, next slide, please. On Monday of this week, NCQA released its Multicultural Healthcare Distinction Program. Um, this is a voluntary evaluation program available to health plans, disease management and wellness organizations, and managed behavioral health care organizations. Um, these organizations are eligible to apply for distinction regardless of whether they participate in NCQA's other accreditation or certification programs. Our standards uh, are available in actually uh, three forms. Um, you should have access through the webinar link to a draft abbreviated set of standards which contain our top level requirements. Um, this document will be available on NCUA's website um, by April 15th in its final form. Um, we have also included a companion document on implementing the standards with uh, commentary and examples. The full set of standards, including scoring details and surveyor guidelines, is available for a fee in uh, two different forms. We have a text form, which is referred to as the standards and guidelines, um, and the interactive uh, self-assessment form, which is referred to as the survey tool. Um, and, and both of those are available for purchase through NCQA's website. Uh, pricing on those uh, products depends on the number of user licenses purchased, um, but it is available now. In addition, NCQA will be offering a full-day educational seminar in May to review the standards in uh, detail uh, for organizations that are candidates for distinction. Um, the full set of standards will be useful to many healthcare organizations to use for self-assessment, even if they're not eligible for our distinction program. Um, advance to slide five, please. So what do the standards cover? Um, there are five standards in all, and if you have them, if you've downloaded them uh, from uh, the Diversity Rx uh, webinar link, you may want to follow along. We will be discussing two of them in greater detail a little bit later in the program, uh, but right now uh, we're just going to go over um, the overview. Um, the details of the scoring are not relevant for this discussion, but I did want to give you a sense of the relative value of the different standards. Um, the first, second, and fifth standard are weighted relatively more heavily, while the third and fourth standard carry a lower weight, and uh, we'll discuss that as we go along. So standard one, race, ethnicity, and language data. Um, this standard aligns with the recent recommendations of the IOM subcommittee on standardization of race, ethnicity, and language data. The standard requires both direct and indirect uh, data collection. Direct data collection being asking people, what is your race, what is your ethnicity, what language do you speak? Um, indirect data collection being using uh, population census information, such as geocoding or, or surnames, um, to impute uh, the race, ethnicity, or language of the individual. Um, the standard is va valued heavily, um, that is, in the scoring, it's weighted heavily, because having good and complete race, ethnicity, and language data is foundational to an organization's ability to serve its multicultural population effectively. Our second standard, language services, requires organizations to translate vital information into threshold languages, to provide interpreter services at all points of contact, and to offer assistance to practitioners in providing language services to their patients. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this standard, too, is weighted relatively heavily because of the importance of the role of communication. And we'll talk more about this standard when we get into our examples because several aspects of it were fairly controversial among our stakeholders. Um, and, and this is where uh, we, we really had to do some um, negotiating uh, to get to a standard that worked. On slide six, we're looking at standards number three and four. Um, and these two standards, while still important, are uh, scored relatively less 
uh, heavily than the others. Standard three, practitioner network cultural responsiveness, elaborates on existing requirements in NCQA's health plan accreditation product. It calls for the organization to make information available to eligible individuals, and by that I mean members or clients, about the race and ethnicity and language of practitioners in the network, and also to analyze and improve the network's ability to meet the cultural and linguistic needs of the membership. Standard four, culturally and linguistically appropriate service programs, is uh, what I would call a structural standard. Uh, requiring the organization to have in place a formal written program approved by the governing body um, and to annually evaluate it. Next slide, please. In addition, the standard requires the substantive involvement of members of the community in program development and evaluation. Slide seven uh, shows our fifth standard, reducing healthcare disparities. Um, this standard, again, is weighted more heavily. Uh, this standard requires the organization to use its race, ethnicity, and language data to stratify performance measures and assess the presence of disparities, to use data about language services and conduct ongoing quality improvement activities to improve culturally and linguistically appropriate services and to reduce disparities. Um, so this is a very brief overview of the content of the standards. Um, we'll get into more detail about two of them in a few minutes, if you could advance the slides. I'd like now to move on to discuss some of the context for the development of these standards and, and give you an idea of some of the considerations uh, that we had um, in developing them. In, in where we landed on some of these uh, controversial points. Um, at NCQA, we see standards and evaluation programs as being part of a continuum. Um, this picture is kind of busy, uh, but we want to draw your attention to the bar across the bottom and the circles across the top. Uh, the bar across the bottom describes sort of a continuum of knowledge, how much we know about an area. And when we know very little about an area, the nature of the problem or what works to solve it, um, clearly the first step in making improvements is to learn more. And so we engage in data collection and research types of activities to um, uh, support our uh, developing that knowledge. As we move along the continuum to the right and begin to understand what works, we can start to develop standards. And as we get to the far right and understand not only what works, but implementation issues, how it works, in what circumstances it works, what conditions are needed uh, to uh, implement these uh, best practices, we can begin to enforce and institutionalize these standards through accreditation programs, public performance reporting, and other kinds of systems of accountability. This voluntary distinction program is a reflection of where we are along this continuum with respect to uh, healthcare disparities. Uh, we know a lot about various dimensions of the problem. Um, there's been a great deal of research that shows the persistence and the presence of disparities. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we know and agree on some best practices, but we have yet to to demonstrate a complete solution or its feasibility and cost effectiveness. So we're still not to the point of being able to um, enforce um, a lot of detailed requirements. So our distinction program is part of this continuum, and we expect it to evolve. Um, the standards will evolve as more evidence about effective solutions and best practices emerges. And over time, standards are likely to be incorporated into NCQA's core accreditation programs. Um, so you know, where we are offering this set of standards as part of an independent and voluntary evaluation program is a reflection of how much we know, how strong the evidence is about what works uh, to reduce disparities. And we expect that as we know more and as the evidence strengthens, um, some of these requirements will um, uh, grow teeth, if you will, 
um, and be moved into more of our core programs. Um, how fast this happens depends on several factors. Um, the strength of the evidence so supporting a solution or practice, um, the availability of leverage for change or implementation of uh, those practices, for example, uh, through regulatory or purchasing power. How organizations actually perform, um, which is a reflection of both the need for standardization, if there's a lot of variation in performance uh, around a, a practice or outcome uh, that we know how to affect, um, that's a reflection of a need for standardization. And it's also a reflection of the feasibility of implementation of a practice across different organizations and structures. Um, and then finally, um, uh, considerations of um, the feasibility of widespread adoption of the best practice. Next slide, please. So in summary, our evaluation program is really a living program and will continue to evolve and develop as best practices emerge and become more widely adopted. So given this context, we'd like to give you a peek into the black box of standards development. Where do these standards come from? It's a complex and sometimes arduous process that attempts to balance a variety of stakeholder interests with the goal of improving practice. This particular program rests on a number of projects that preceded it. Um, considering our developmental continuum picture, uh, the, that we looked at just a few minutes ago. NTQA began uh, this area of work by conducting research on disparities in health plans and discovered that even when people have similar access to care and similar health care coverage, significant disparities exist. Next slide, please. Um, details of these programs are available on NTQA's website, and we've provided links to you for um, many of these reports. Um, both at the end of this presentation and on the Diversity RX um, webinar link. So we started our work on developing standards by gathering information that would help us determine what kind of program to offer. We interviewed a large number of stakeholders, including health plans, disease management, wellness organizations, healthcare purchasers, government agencies, consumer advocates to assess whether there was an interest in standards and an evaluation program. Uh, we collected existing um, and developing standards, such as the OMH class standards, the NQF preferred practices, which were in development themselves when we started, uh, and various other sources and uh, research evidence, including what we could glean about what was doable from our Multicultural Healthcare Awards program. Using all these data sources, we put together essentially what amounted to a straw man proposal, outlining a voluntary evaluation program that would evaluate performance on key dimensions. We convened an advisory committee that included both stakeholders and content experts and we used this committee, as well as no, a number of other standing committees at NCQA, to review and vet the standards and program design in an iterative, iterative process. Next slide, please. We had a number of twists and turns as we went through the process. And um, I wanted to invite uh, Kathy Colton of Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare and Ellen Wu of California Panethnic Network, who were both members of our class standards advisory committee to share the perspective, uh, their perspective on the standards development process. Through this conversation, uh, Kathy and Ellen will be sharing their different perspectives as health plan and consumer advocate, and we'll go into some of the details on two of the more interesting and controversial standards that we had to work through. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to start with a, a general question uh, to both uh, Kathy and Ellen about um, stakeholder representation. Specifically, how well were different stakeholders represented in the standards development process? And in, in your um, estimation, which stakeholders had the most and least influence? Kathy, do you want to start? Sure. Um, 
I think, first of all, that the advisory committee was well balanced in terms of stakeholder groups. There were three health plans, um, three government sort of quasi-regulatory um, stakeholder participants, three advocates, um, a labor union, a provider. And I would say that the health plans that participated were those that were at the forefront of supporting and implementing um, cultural and linguistically appropriate services. But this process encompassed a phase of broad feedback and public comment um, from all stakeholder groups, uh, including you know, a much broader group of health plans. I think that the influence was fairly well distributed. Um, and that reality necessarily trumped ideals in some cases. Um, and while that could be interpreted as health plan influence, I think it was more a recognition of readiness and an understanding that goals are not the same as standards. Standards are what we're, we're really um, able to try to adhere to in the present. Goals are where we want to be. And the standards should push us toward those goals, but not be so unrealistic um, that we're not able to achieve them. And I think um, the committee came to a good balance in that regard. Thanks, Kathy. Ellen, what about your perspective? Um, yeah, hi, hi everyone. Um, I actually sit on a lot of advisory boards where um, consumer advocates are often outnumbered by industry, um, such as the hospitals, health plans, and providers. And on this one, I actually didn't feel this way. I, I think I agree with Kathy in that um, everyone at the table were on um, the cutting edge, and um, they were very committed to advancing disparities work. Uh, I would say um, that my experience wasn't as much as the most or least influential um, by stakeholder group, but more about the timing, being able to time the influence. Um, so. The feedback process seemed linear, where there there was a, a dis distinct process. So that if you got your your comments in kind of at the critical decision points, um, you were more likely to influence them than obviously if you if they were later in the process or um, if they were too early um, after having received all the feedback. Um, I think for me the least transparent part of the, Part of it was was the pu public comments, and um, I think things changed a lot from the public comments, where we didn't kind of get to see the scope of um, all of those decisions and all the comments that came in. Um, I would say that the harder part was balancing the geographical differences, because um, in California we have a lot of laws and regulations in place, where many of the health plans are already ahead of what is being proposed as um, minimum standards. So we had a different, from my perspective, we had a different bar from where we wanted to push the field. Um, so while there were some areas that the minimum floor could be stronger, I think overall the product is really good. And with enough voluntary take up by health plans, it will definitely help move the field. Uh, thank you both. Uh, next slide, please. Um, interesting um, that, that you should mention the importance of timing and, and providing feedback. Um, we had, um, uh, as I mentioned before, a number of different stakeholder groups. Our um, Class Standards Advisory Committee that Kathy and Ellen were both part of was the, the one group that was continuously involved uh, from beginning to end of this project, but NCQA also uh, hosts other stakeholder groups. We have a consumer advisory committee and a, and a purchaser advisory committee and a uh, public um, uh, advisory committee and a uh, healthcare practitioner advisory committee. We, so we've got a whole, whole bunch of different uh, more single focused uh, or single stakeholder committees um, that we uh, also consulted as we uh, went through this process, and of course, de depending on where we were in the process when they were meeting, they got to touch it at a specific point in time. Um, we also took our um, draft standards through a public comment process. Hopefully many of you uh, were involved in that process uh, where just over a year ago now uh, we posted them 
uh, for several weeks on the web and invited comments from from all comers. Um, and so um, that was also a very influential process. And, and that was right when the economy was taking a nosedive. And so um, part of what we got during that public comment process was um, these may be good ideas, but um, the timing is just incredibly challenging. We're doing everything we can to stay afloat right now, um, and we can't tolerate a whole lot of new, strong, uh, expensive requirements. Um, and so we had gone through, as I mentioned, some twists and turns. At one point, we thought maybe we would include a number of these standards in our core accreditation uh, products. Um, and it was as a result of the, the public comment that said, too, too, too much, too fast, um, that we backed off of that plan and went back to our original uh, plan, which was to offer this as an independent, uh, voluntary evaluation product. Um, so we do try very hard to be responsive to um, mm -hmm. our comments and to um, uh, make sure that our process builds in a good balance um, of uh, stakeholder input. Um, let, let's talk about the first standard on race, ethnicity, and language data for a moment. This was an interesting standard that um, um, we've seen a, um, a real wide range on uh, performance uh, to date. Um, and uh, we went back and forth, and the standard took a number of different forms over time. Um, I, I'm curious if, um, Kathy and Ellen, you can both talk to us a little bit about, um, as we embarked on this process, what was your um, ideal going in, you know, in terms of what the standard might look like, um, and how close does the final standard come to that ideal? Um, what did you have to compromise on, and what what did you uh, gain as a result uh, of that? And Ellen, maybe you could start on this one. Okay, so I I actually am pretty happy with this um, standard and how it ended up. I think it, this is a really hard but critical element of being able to address health disparities. Um, I think the for for an, from an advocate perspective, the important part was the emphasis on the collection of data from individual um, patients and not a secondary source. Um, but we also realized that that is really difficult to do um, in, in, in starting up. Um, they, don't, they don't get enough response rates. Um, so I like how the standard is framed that indirect data should not take the place of individual data collection but supplement it until that time that they do get a high enough response rate to have a good demographic profile of their enrollment population. Um, I think, as you can see from the general overview of the standard as well as the implementation guide, it, it is comprehensive. Um, I think where the compromise comes in is with the scoring of individual elements um, that contribute then to the overall score and whether or not you pass on that element. Um, there, I think there are some elements that um, such as absolutely having a process in place to collect direct patient data that I would, would have liked to see to be required as a required element to pass on that specific standard rather than just being a part of an aggregate score. Great. Thanks. Kathy? Um, well, I would uh, certainly say that I started out agreeing that health plans should collect self-reported race, ethnicity, and language data. Um, and I'm glad to see that you know, we came to agreement on that pretty easily and pretty quickly. I think one of the sticking points was whether there should be a threshold for the percentage of members on whom health plans should have self-reported data. And there was a lot of discussion around that. And I think it was recognized in the committee that health plans were starting at different places, that they serve different populations, and that um, setting a threshold at the outset might be premature, and that it is something that through this evolutionary process could come later as we learn what early adopters and innovators are able to achieve in this area. 
Um, that said, I was also pleased that indirect uh, estimation methods were included um, as a way to supplement self-reported data because I think it's very important when you look later on in the standards, for example, at the use of data to identify disparities, that um, you often really need to supplement the self-reported data with indirectly estimated data in order to have both a large enough sample size and a representative um, sample. Sometimes the people from whom we're able to collect self-reported data may not be representative um, of the broader membership. And I would be more concerned about representativeness even than meeting a threshold. So I think we did a good job of balancing um, these issues and concerns. And I think NCQA's um, final standards in this area are fair and realistic, but I think they will push a lot of health plans that have not yet engaged in the data collection process to begin doing so. Thanks. You know, the um, discussions that we had about the threshold I thought were, um, were really interesting. I mean, we started out um, saying that um, organizations needed to have directly uh, collected um, race, ethnicity, and language data on a certain percent of their uh, population. Um, the idea being that you know this would give th this requirement some teeth. It would mean you know everybody would have to invest in these uh, uh, direct approaches to collecting data. Um, but as we looked at it further, as, as you mentioned, Kathy, um, we realized that that actually creates some unintended consequences. Um, just for example, it's easy to collect language information on the English-speaking members of, of your community. It's not so easy um, to collect that data on the rest. And so if you have a threshold or a, cer a certain percentage requ requirement that you're aiming for, um, you're going to go after what's easy to complete rather than what's most useful to serving the, the full population. And we certainly did not want to encourage that kind of gaming. Um, so that was one of the considerations. It's, it's interesting to me now to see that the uh, proposed uh, rules for meaningful use also include a threshold for um, the uh, race, ethnicity, and language data. Um, and we'll, it will be interesting to follow how that plays out. Uh, moving on to the next slide, let's talk a little bit about some of the practical aspects of uh, meeting the data collection standard. Mm -hmm. What challenges uh, will organizations have to overcome uh, to meet the standard? Um, and how will meeting the standard advance current practice? So we're still looking at um, including a combination of direct data and indirect data, um, how is that going to actually move the field forward? And what are some practical steps that organizations can take uh, right now to move this process? Kathy? Well, starting with the challenges, um, I think the first one is that health plans have almost no face-to-face -face contact with their members. And they have limited one-on-one -on -one personal contact, um, which is primarily by phone. So most of the contact a health plan has with its member is through broad population-based communication channels, uh, newsletters, um, subscriber mailings. Um, and so reaching the population and reaching them in a context that makes it comfortable for the member to share that information is certainly a challenge. Um, the only channel that touches all subscribers, and that's not all members, um, is enrollment. Uh, but in that particular interaction, the health plan is acting as a payer during the enrollment process. And there tends to be more distrust and people are less willing to disclose information. Whereas post-enrollment, 
often the health plan is acting as a provider, whether it's through disease management programs, case management, uh, wellness programs, and so forth. And members seem to be more open to providing information um, in those contexts. So I think uh, one of the uh, uh, practical steps that health plans can take is to identify all of the channels through which they communicate with members and which of them seem to be most ripe <laughs> and most acceptable to members um, for implementing uh, data collection uh, steps. And I think that if they do that, what is likely to happen is that initially the people on whom they have self-reported data may not be representative of their general membership but will represent their most vulnerable members, um, those that either are in need of services and therefore the plan is outreaching to them and collecting the data as part of an outreach effort, um, or they're providing case management or disease management type services. So um, I think that mechanism is not only more acceptable to members, but gets to the people that um, are most vulnerable. Thanks. Uh, next slide, please. Ellen, what do you think advocates, uh, purchasers, healthcare providers uh, can do to help organizations meet the standard? I think um, we all have to keep pushing the field of um, this, this on this issue until the collection of, of an analysis of race, ethnicity, and language data is integrated and commonplace um, that we don't even have to think about its utility or necessity such as providing your birth date. Um, specifically, advocates can continue to work on laws and regulations and institutional policies on data collection. And we should um, soon be ready to move beyond just the collection of the data, but also analysis and quality improvement actions as a result of the findings. Purchasers can help by providing the data they have available to health plans. Um, I know this makes some people are nervous with the potential misuse of information for discriminatory and redlining practices, um, but there needs to be enough firewalls and protections that this doesn't happen. And as much as data is being collected by an entity, it would be great to share it so we don't um, we aren't duplicating efforts. And healthcare providers can also start collecting race, ethnicity, and language data. They um, might be a more appropriate entity as they are on the front lines and have the direct one-on-one face-to-face -on -one, um, -face interaction with them. And it would also be important to have a system for them to share the data they collect with the health plans. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Moving on, um, let's, let's talk about um, standard number two, um, which addresses um, language services, and in particular, the first element, uh, which has to do with translation of written materials. Um, this um, standard, as I mentioned, went, uh, went through a number of twists and turns as well. Um, and um, we landed on uh, a requirement that the organization has to have a, a documented process for providing vital information in threshold languages. Um, and um, that, that those words were carefully chosen. Uh, vital information is a, probably a subset of what might be considered uh, vital documents in the, in the Title VI um, uh, policy guidance. Um, threshold languages we uh, tied to the safe harbor thresholds in uh, the, the Title VI uh, requirements. Um, which is a, a fairly high threshold. And what we were trying to do was essentially to balance uh, how much information needs to be um, uh, translated with how many different languages it would need to be translated into. So considering um, this standard on translation of written materials, uh, again, what was your ideal going in? What did you hope for? Um, how close does the final standard come to this? What did you have to compromise on, and, and what did you get in, in return? Ellen, do you want to start this time? 
Uh, sure. Um, I think you pointed out in your, your introduction of the issue some of the what the advocates were trying to push for, and, and that is more specificity um, around what uh, kind of vital information, a specific definition of what vital information is, and certainly um, what, a t in it, such as in a t timely manner, um, a definition of, of what that means, because everybody has kind of their own interpretation of what that would um, constitute. Uh, I know we did struggle with what was an appropriate threshold um, to set, and um, what was lacking in that conversation was being able to even look at data, since nobody really had it, to have a sense of um, if what how the different levels might impact different communities. Um, so that was that was actually a hard conversation without having that information. I think um, another issue is the idea of um, the translated materials really need to be proactively sent out to members based on the language needs identified. Most of the time, this process is passive, where um, health plans will say these materials are available upon request, and often those directions are um, on how to request it are only in English. So there's a disconnect there of having translated documents kind of sitting around waiting to be requested and rather using the data that um, health plans have available for their members and sending them out um, directly. And, um, and then I, I know we also struggled with the quality, ensuring the quality of the translation. And because there um, is not yet any certification program on um, interpreters or translators, we have to rely on a very deliberative process. Um, California's Medi-Cal Managed Care Program, or Medicaid program, has developed a flowchart of a mo model practices for developing translated materials that have many um, review processes in place so that um, a translated material has, goes through many layers of screening for different things, for cultural appropriateness, for edits. Um, um, it's currently a reference as part of, I believe, the implementation guide and the standards, but um, I think that those concepts could have been more strongly incorporated. Um, and then on, on the positive side, I think the notification of language services standards are, are really strong. Um, in California, we had a hard time with this issue in having health plans provide notification to their enrollees in multiple languages. Um, not just the threshold languages, about their right to um, language services. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, Kathy? Actually, this is one where um, I agree with Ellen. Um, and even coming from a different uh, position, you know, as a health plan, um, I think that the struggle she described, um, you know, is accurate. And I think that, um, one of the, the pluses to where we ended up is that it's fairly consistent with other standards that health plans um, are being held to in terms of like the standards that CMS supplies um, to uh, plans that participate in the Medicare programs. So um, to me, that was good. Um, I think that I recognize that uh, the CMS standards, which are based on the um, Office of Civil Rights recommendations, have been around for quite some time. And you know, I understand that there is probably um, you know a, a feeling of urgency to try to move the bar on this. But given that a lot of health plans are really struggling to collect this information. Um, and don't know what they're going to see when they have it on a critical mass of members, that this is a reasonable um, starting point. And I assume this is one of those standards that over time um, will be strengthened. Um, I do agree that the notification um, element D of this standard is a strong one and one that um, may pose some challenges to health plans, but I think is a reasonable um, standard to implement. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. So uh, thinking about this um, 
uh, translation standard, um, what challenges will organizations have to overcome to meet the standard, um, and how will meeting the standard advance current practice, and what are some practical steps that organizations can take right away? Kathy, do you want to shed some light on those questions? Sure. Um, I think that uh, one of the challenges is being able to identify a qualified translation uh, vendor or being able to develop an in-house program that uh, is adequate and um, has an element of quality assurance to it. I think that the field in general is really beginning to come up to speed in identifying standards for the translation industry, but we're not quite there yet, and I think that a lot of health plans are going to need to go back and look at their contracting requirements for translation vendors and begin to ask some questions about whether, in fact, some of the translations that they're already using are, in fact, um, up to the quality standards that uh, have been identified by some of these organizations. I think that um, you know, we're early in the developmental cycle for accreditation and certification of translation providers. There aren't going to be a lot of translation providers available who are certified at, at, the, at the outset. So we'll, have, we'll be competing for a limited number of agencies, and that uh, may be a challenge. But I think these standards will raise the awareness of language access issues throughout the health plans, um, improve the process for contracting, and thereby improve the quality of the translations. There are quite a few resources out there, and I would point people toward the National Health Plan Collaborative Toolkit, which has some nice materials around assessing your language services and um, uh, steps that uh, can be taken to improve them. Uh, AHIP Americans Health Insurance Plans also has a publication on uh, communication and improving communication with diverse populations. Um, the uh, International Medical Interpreter Association has some translation guidelines, and um, also the um, this is the National Council on Interpreters in Healthcare, I think it is, um, you know, are developing guidelines for interpreter services. And I would, I would point to organizations to all of those resources and thinking about how to implement the processes they need to to meet this standard. Thanks. Um, next slide, please. So, Ellen, how can advocates, purchasers, and healthcare providers help organizations to meet this standard? And if more organizations do meet the standard, how will care for linguistic minorities be improved? Um, okay, so I think uh, obviously advocates can continue pushing the field. Um, I think we really need to better understand how the thresholds are working, and um, if they're appropriate at the appropriate levels, and holding institutional and government agencies accountable for complying with um, standards. I know in California we have standards on our public hospitals and um, threshold levels for public hospitals and our government agencies that aren't being monitored. Um, I think we need to educate our consumers and, and help with identifying um, an agreed upon list of what vital information or vital documents are, because I think that's a often um, kind of when we, we talk about these issues still a source of um, debate. Um, purchasers, I think purchasers play a large role in this issue, and they require quality translated materials from their health plans. They are paying quite a bit of money for health plans to provide services th to their employees, and um, those employees might <coughs> not have, um, have English as their, their first primary language, um, and, and they should have equal access to the same information as English speakers about their health plan benefits. Um, and healthcare providers can also put pressure on health plans to help them identify common materials that are used, and so they, they can help them trans get them translated. So again, there are no duplication of efforts. And I think um, the ability to read your health information is very, very critical. Um, for example, we we all know 
that the evidence of coverage and disclosure that we receive from health plans are kind of impossible to read. It's in legalese. But it's the document that spells out all of your benefits and, more importantly, what is not covered under your health plan. Um, so those of us who, speak, who read English well are often frustrated with it, but imagine what it would be like if you got that in a language that you couldn't read. Um, right now in California, we're currently working and um, fighting with the Board of Pharmacy to require pharmacies to use translated labels. Um, we are a state of uh, majority minority, where 56% of the Californians are people of color, yet um, we're still not receiving the same equal access to services. So it's clear that if we um, have uh, better access through uh, translations, um, a lot more people will be included in the in coverage. Thanks. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, I just wanted to uh, try and highlight some of the um, themes that we've heard in our discussion uh, today. Um, first, that um, we are dealing with um, balancing um, different concerns. Um, and really less so the, um, the idea that uh, we had some people holding back and others saying we need to go forward, but more that uh, we need to balance uh, what's currently doable, what's uh, economically feasible um, today with our aspirations, with where we know we all want to go. Um, and um, that um, balancing act really did play out uh, through development of all the standards. Um, and um, a as you heard, I think, in this uh, discussion about the, the language uh, services standards, um, there, are, there are things happening in the field which are too new yet to fully rely on. So the development of certification programs, for example, for um, translators and healthcare interpreters um, appears uh, to have a great deal of value, but it's not ready for prime time. It can't be relied on yet because it isn't actually in existence yet. So we can uh, begin to point in that direction. We can hope for it to emerge soon, but even as it uh, becomes available, it's going to take some time uh, before um, it's, uh, it's sort of ready for prime time, before there's an enough uh, traction, enough actual certified providers um, that we can require their use. Um, so it's that kind of a developmental process that we uh, go through. also heard a lot of interesting uh, discussion about um, geography uh, being a, an issue here. Um, so uh, our country is, is not uh, evenly distributed in terms of race, ethnicity, and language, and some of the um, uh, diversity that we find is concentrated in some areas, um, and uh, other areas are still really um, uh, quite non-diverse. Um, and so the um, amount of interest, attention, and um, investment that both purchasers and providers are willing to put in is, is probably um, related to the diversity that they actually observe in, in their own communities. So um, back to how do these, um, how do these programs, uh, these standards and our evaluation programs evolve? Um, we have um, you know some, some critical conditions that need to be met for, um, these standards to be absorbed into our core accreditation products. Um, we'd like to see them in use, um, certainly on a voluntary basis. We'd like to, to have some demonstration that it is feasible to meet these standards. Uh, we'd like to understand better what the costs of implementing um, actions to meet the standards are. Um, but um, uh, clearly there needs to be some um, uptake. I think um, much of our most recent legislation, both the, the uh, ARA, the CHIPRA, and now most recently our health reform bills, they all have provisions in them related to 
uh, uh, culturally and uh, linguistically appropriate services and the reduction of health care disparities, um, the um, meaningful use requirements also support uh, data collection on r race, ethnicity, and language and their use um, in providing uh, care. So we have, I think, a convergence of um, uh, policies that are going to advance this cause as well and perhaps move move this a little bit faster than uh, had those um, uh, reforms not taken place. Um, advocates clearly still have um, a good deal of work to do in, um, in uh, getting interest both at the grassroots level but as well as the local policy level. Um, and health plans and health care delivery organizations have a lot of work to do in um, making these standards a reality and in rolling up their sleeves and sort of doing a lot of the practical work um, that needs to be done to better understand who they're serving, um, which of their subpopulations are uh, not being well served, how they can serve them better, um, and, and taking those actions uh, to do that. Um, I just want to point out, next slide please, a few resources that are available uh, to you uh, to, um, to, to help as you move forward. Um, Multicultural Healthcare Quality Improvement Guide is a web-based uh, guide that uh, includes both um, information and instruction on applying the quality improvement process to uh, class and disparities, and it also has a very um, comprehensive catalog of resources available um, that um, that can be used or adapted. Um, they've been vetted by an expert panel, and so it sort of helps you um, uh, narrow down your search. You don't have to Google everything. Um, moving on to slide 22. Um, NCQA also has uh, four annual reports, our innovative practice reports, um, that provide details about um, award-winning uh, health plan efforts to improve care for their diverse populations. We ran an awards program over four years and um, for each one um, produced a report that's got um, details of the winner's efforts. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then uh, we have, uh, in addition, uh, some um, other resources on our website. Um, we've got uh, this uh, small practices report, um, something that we haven't talked about a lot today, but um, uh, NCQA, as part of one of its earlier projects, um, spent a year working with small practices in New Jersey and California. Uh, to test um, what was needed to support them in um, engaging in effective quality improvement to improve care to their uh, minority populations. And um, this report uh, details some of the findings uh, from that study. Um, next slide, please. At this point, I think we can um, throw it open for questions. A number of questions have come in already, and I'll start with those. Um, but um, if you have more questions, you can use the question panel on your um, uh, GoToWebinar uh, to uh, send in more questions, and we will try to address them. Um, and again, if you can uh, direct your questions to either myself, Jessica, or uh, Kathy or Ellen that will help us get the right person to answer them. Um, I have a first set of questions uh, really um, relates broadly to you know who are these standards useful for? Um, we've heard a lot of discussion about um, health plans, um, but can these standards be applied to other kinds of um, health care uh, providers, whether it's um, solo, small group um, physician practices, uh, public health departments, or um, other kinds of organizations. Um, 
and I will uh, try to answer that question. Uh, the standards are probably more broadly applicable than our um, uh, evaluation program, our, our distinction program. Our distinction program is open to health plans, managed behavioral health care organizations, and disease management and wellness organizations. These are all organizations that uh, work with uh, defined populations. Um, I think the standards, though, could be very useful to almost any institutional health care provider. Um, so a large clinic or a hospital or um, a public health department um, could use many, if not uh, most of the standards. They're probably least applicable to the individual physician or physician practice um, because the standards really focus on um, the organization of healthcare uh, services um, and not so much on the direct delivery of services. Um, so I would say that for the most part they don't apply directly to uh, physician practices. However, they may be useful to physician practices that work with these other institutional uh, providers. Um, there's certainly a, um, a degree to which uh, collaboration between um, health plans and physician practices or between practices and um, public health departments and so forth uh, could significantly um, improve care to um, our uh, multicultural and generally underserved populations. Um, okay. Another question about the data collection and translation standards. Do they address issues relating to improving access and the delivery of services to members with low health literacy? Um, that is a great question. Um, we talked a little about health literacy in our um, uh, advisory committee work, but we did not address it directly um, in the standards. Um, we were focusing uh, uh, largely on um, linguistic minorities rather than low literacy. Um, uh, individuals, but we do recognize that as a gap, um, and I'm not sure um, how we will address that, but certainly um, NCQA is involved in um, a lot of work around uh, patient-centered care, um, patient-centered medical homes, and um, it stands to reason that um, our efforts on uh, uh, related to language access for linguistic minorities will at some point converge with our efforts around patient-centered care uh, to address uh, low literacy. But I'd be interested if um, Kathy or Ellen, if you have any um, insights about how we might um, in a, in a next iteration, um, integrate literacy issues with uh, uh, language access and language services standards? Um, th uh, this is Ellen, actually. Th that is a good question. I was, I was going to bring it up um, as part of my response. I did see in this, it was either the standards or the implementation guide, that as part of the translation process, and this is um, part of a, a good translation process, is they, that the original English document that you're starting with is culturally appropriate. So, you know, in California, we have standards for our Medicaid and um, SCHIP programs that materials need to be at a sixth grade reading level so that um, once it goes through the translation process, it's already, um, the original was um, in a place that was um, readable and understandable for the target population. I think that's part of the implementation guide, Jessica, or there's, there's something I read um, last night about it. Um, but I think 
those kinds of issues definitely come up in the translation process, which is why uh, a quality kind of procedures um, and, and reviews and cultural reviews are, are so critical. Kathy, anything to add? Well, I think that you know these standards were really um, targeted to improve multicultural care, um, to make organizations aware of the need um, to adapt to meet the needs of a diverse membership. I think that health literacy is an extremely important issue, but it cuts across um, multicultural lines. Um, and I'm wondering if a better place for it might simply be in the regular standards um, around, uh, you know, member rights and responsibilities or some of the standards that um, guarantee that uh, people have access to information and can, can um, uh, read that information. Thank you. Um, we have uh, uh, several other questions about how to um, educate uh, potential clients. And by this, I think uh, we're talking about um, uh, patients and um, healthcare uh, consumers, um, uh, about the availability of uh, language services um, and uh, consequences uh, for not knowing that, that uh, services are available or useful. Um, and our, our uh, language uh, standards, our language access standards do include a requirement for organizations to communicate uh, to their clients. Um, so. Um, uh, and actually, I'll just read it to you because it's very brief. Um, it's called Notification of Language Services, and the requirement reads that annually the organization distributes written notice in English and any languages spoken by 1% or 200 eligible individuals, whichever is less, up to a maximum of 15 languages, that the organization provides free language assistance and how the eligible individual can obtain the service. So that kind of a notice certainly falls short of a full-fledged education program um, directed at uh, non-English speakers, but it does go a good deal further than I think is standard practice um, across the country in making um, information available about uh, the availability of language services. Um, so that's uh, how we've addressed it. Um, in general, um, when NTQA develops standards, we uh, try to um, develop them at a level that is um, uh, broadly, if not universally, applicable and leave to the individual implementing organization decisions about how to go about um, meeting the standard. Um, so, for some, there may be a you know a, a notice page that goes out to all um, all members um, in an annual communication. For others, there may be multiple avenues of communication, including um, health education classes that might address language issues. Um, but we're leaving um, that open to uh, to the participating organizations to decide. Um, another question about whether families and clients were involved in the um, uh, advisory committee or the um, stakeholder uh, process. Um, NCQA did not uh, engage uh, healthcare consumers directly. However, we did uh, engage uh, consumer advocates. Um, in a couple of different ways. Uh, we, as um, we mentioned earlier, we had three uh, consumer advocates sitting on the Class Standards Advisory Committee. In addition, we have consumer advocates uh, represented on our Standards Committee, which reviews all of our um, 
standards and evaluation programs. Um, and um, we have a, a consumer advisory committee uh, as one of our standing committees uh, with whom we uh, consulted in the development of this program. And then finally, when we went to public comment, um, comments were accepted from anybody. And we presume that uh, the consumer advocates uh, to whom we gave notice about the public uh, comment period uh, would have engaged um, uh, families and clients more directly. Um, okay. Jessica, we probably have time for about one more question. One more question. OK. Um, one more question. Does NCQA envision connecting these new multicultural healthcare standards in the near future to their important certification programs relating to patient-centered medical homes? Um, I, I would say that the general answer to that is, yes, we see connections both to our um, patient-centered medical homework and to our um, uh, organizational accreditation and certification standards. Um, and um, uh, you know, certainly we uh, try to cross-fertilize our programs as, as we develop them. And the patient-centered medical homes is going through an update right now, which, which will um, inevitably include a consideration of um, uh, cultural competence issues. Um, again, um, the, the timing of integration and the, the timing uh, in which we um, move forward standards like this in, into sort of hard uh, requirements um, in um, other programs uh, depends on some of those other considerations that I mentioned. So with that, I guess we can wrap up. That's terrific. Thank you all of you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us. Um, we just wanted to end by letting you know that all these resources are available, as many resources as possible, are available on our um, DiversityRx website at webinar um, at www.diversityrxconference.org webinar 6. Um, as you can see here. And um, we also wanted to announce that we have another webinar coming up on April 16th at 12.30 PM. And that's going to be going over the Joint Commission's new standards in this field. And you can read more about that webinar at diversityrxconference.org slash webinar 7. So thank you, Jessica, Ellen, and Kathy for your candid comments and insights into the development of these standards and their implications for healthcare organizations and for generously sharing resources with our participants.